So this video is going to be an eye opener for some folks and one I'm really excited to jump into. It's something I've been thinking about for a while and every time I'm on the forums or I'm looking and helping people shop for receivers in their systems, this is a question that always comes up is what specs do I look for? What's really important and what should I pay attention to? So I'm really excited to dive into this video this week because this is a conversation I've been having for years with a lot of different folks and I'm really excited to bring it to the channel and bring it to you folks so that you guys can hear all my thoughts on this topic at the same time. So have you been reading the receiver respects all wrong? Let's dive into this video and find out. Hi everyone, I'm Dippin' with CE Critic. In this video, I'm gonna explain how to read the specs on a receiver, and I'm gonna explain what specs you should pay attention to to save you time. Now, let's start with what is a receiver. Well, in the home theater and AV space, a receiver is an all-in-one system, and it has two functions. It has a processing function and an amplification function. So how do you read the specs and what information do you pay attention to? Well, first let's start on the processing side. Now, a lot of this and the cost of the receiver actually comes down into the licensing fees that all these companies have to pay. They have to pay licensing fees for Dolby Vision, any iMac certifications, anything that do with the video processing. They also have to pay fees for HDMI, for any of the inputs that they're using. So all those goes into the cost of the receiver. So that's why when you see something that has a lot of features as well as a lot of HDMI inputs, the costs tend to go up. Now. Well, let's talk about HDMI and its capabilities for a second. And when you're looking at specs and what you should be paying attention to is making sure you have the right amount of HDMI standards on all the inputs. So what does that mean? Well, you can have HDMI 1, you can have HDMI 1.4, which was some of the older ones. Now you have HDMI 2.0, which is the minimum that you need for any 4K movies or for any HDR type of stuff. And then you have HDMI 2.1, which if you're a gamer, that's going to be really, really important because that's how you're going to get your VRR, the higher refresh rates and the higher frame rates that you're looking for in your setup. So what do receiver companies say that kind of makes things a little bit confusing is, well, they'll say that like, oh, okay, we can do your HDMI 4K 120 Hertz, but really it's through HDMI pass-through. Now, not all the inputs have HDMI pass-through, so that's something you have to pay attention to. So if you've got multiple consoles, if you've got an Xbox, you've got a PlayStation 5, you've got a PC, and you want to make sure all of them can run, full range, we're doing 4K, 120 Hertz, or even more, you have to make sure that all the inputs on the receiver have HDMI pass-through. So the way you'll see a lot of these companies sell it, they'll say, oh, they can do 4K, 120 Hertz, or whatever the standard is, but it's only on one input or two inputs, and then you don't always get an explanation on which one to use. So these are some of the things you wanna keep in mind as you're shopping for a receiver. The other thing is on the audio side now. So again, two sides to the receiver, the processing side and the amplification side. This is when things get really, really tricky. So what you see is a lot of these receiver companies, they'll say something like the receiver is rated at 150 watts, but they don't tell you that's 150 watts only when two channels are driven. What that basically means is your front, right, and left speaker. So if you're doing two channel audio, each one of those is gonna get 150 watts. Now, when you start to add your regular system, your home theater system, whether it's 5.1, 7.1, all the Atmos channels, that's when things start to get a little bit more tricky. And that's when you start to see the wattages actually go down. Now, they don't typically publish this because they don't want to say, oh, it's 150 watts and two channels. And then if you're running all channels driven, so that's the key phrase there, that's the pro tip. You have to look for all channels driven. It actually might be closer to like 40 watts a channel. So you might be thinking you're getting a receiver that does 150 watts, all channels driven, but really it's only for two channels. But when you're running a full home theater system, you're actually only getting 40, maybe 50 watts channel to each one of those speakers. And then you're wondering why the performance is varying so much. And what's really important here, especially on the speaker side, now having done customer service for speaker companies um, and having seen a lot of these um, blown speakers come through, what people don't realize is the way that people blow speakers is by underpowering. Because you turn the volume up, you're trying to get a level of performance out of the speaker that you don't have enough power to do. 
and you end up blowing the speaker. So nine times out of 10, the way most speakers are blown is because they're underpowered versus overpowered. To blow a speaker because you have too much power takes a lot of work. Not only do you have to have a really high level of voltage and electricity going to those speakers, but you also need to have it for a sustained period of time. Now, let's talk more about what to pay attention to on the audio side to make sure you're getting the right amount of power. So the first thing you want to look at is whatever speakers are in your system, what their level of sensitivity is. So you'll see things like, oh, the sensitivity is 89 dB, 90, 91, 92. Now, there's a lot of um, bits of information out there uh, about how to calculate all this and how to understand what power level you might need for your speakers versus performance. If that's something you guys are interested in, please leave a comment below and I can cover it in a future video. But basically, the lower the number, the more power the speaker are going to need to hit a certain SPL level. So SPL stands for sound pressure level and that's really what most people are looking for when they're experiencing a home theater system. They want to know how loud can it go, how well can it pressurize the room. So when you're looking at your receiver you want to make sure it's in line with speaker sensitivity. The other is the load rating. So you'll see some things like 6 ohms, 8 ohms, 2 ohms. What you really need to pay attention to here is what your speakers are actually rated at. Now, you'll also see receivers that say, oh, the power rating shifts depending on the load. So if it's a 4 ohm speaker, it has a different power rating. And then if you have an 8 ohm speaker, it has a completely different power rating. One thing to keep in mind, and I don't want to get too much into the uh, details around amplification and speaker amplification, unless you guys make comments down below. But basically, the load from 2 ohms all the way 8 ohms, sometimes 16 ohms, is present at all times for the speaker. It's just depending on what the draw is that the speaker is going to need to hit the performance level that you want. And by the way, let me just take a quick side note here. If you guys want to figure out how you actually like to listen and at what levels, don't trust the gain levels on the receivers because a lot of times they're doing something different than what you think the output is. So I recommend getting like an SPL meter. This is one I got off of Amazon. I'll put down the link below. I think it was like $20 or something like that. Just get an SPL meter, go into your home theater system or whatever system you have and start listening to whatever you're excited about, whether it's a movie, a piece of music, and listen to it at a volume level that you're comfortable. And then once you pull out the SPL meter and you measure at what level you like to listen, that's going to determine really how much power you're going to need uh, for your system and for your speakers. Um, one thing I want to call out here, uh, you know, on the amplification side is one thing that people get wrong with, with powering speakers is they assume that the speakers are getting pushed power. That's not true. The job of the amplifier is to have enough power for when the speakers pull it. The speakers are pulling power from the amplifier or from the amplifier section of the receiver to give a level of performance that you're looking for. So even if the speakers are rated, you know, pretty aggressively at 89 dB or 88 dB where they need a lot of power, if you are someone who likes to listen at 60, 65 dB in your room, those 40, 50 watts that are coming from all channels might be enough for you. But when you start to crank up the volume and you want to start listening at reference level or something like 90, 95 dB, which is really, really loud, then you're going to need more power for the speakers to perform at the level you're looking for. And that's usually where speakers get blown, like I said. People will turn the volume up, they're looking for 90, 95 dB of power in their room, or excuse me, sound pressure levels in the room. And then all of a sudden they blow one of the drivers because the receiver that they thought was 150 watts all channels driven were actually 150 watts two channel driven and somewhere around 40 50 watts all channels driven now another thing that you want to pay attention to um when you're looking at the audio side is going to be the subwoofer outputs now on the subwoofers you're going to see sometimes a receiver say it has two subwoofers out now, depending on your system, it can be a big deal, it cannot be a big deal. You're going to want to find out if those two subwoofers will act independently or if they have the same signal that's coming through. Depending on that is going to depend on how, how you're going to calibrate it in the room, whether you're going to set different crossover points or not. But a lot of the times, especially when you get to the mid, mid-high level, uh, receivers usually is they're not independently controlled or the signals not independent. When you start to get to the higher end receivers, that's when you have independent subwoofer control and you can do different things in your setup where you have one one um, subwoofer that you have a very specific high and low filter set up for, and then you have a second subwoofer that's 
you know, dealing with a different frequency range. So that's another thing to keep in mind. And another thing you want to keep in mind is whether there's some certifications around the audio side. I know some folks aren't too big on the THX certifications, but if you go through that process, they do have minimum specs that they expect the receiver or processor to, to have to hit whatever they need from a video standpoint and from an audio standpoint. And those certifications are just giving you a guarantee. Now, I don't want to get down the whole rabbit hole of like THX and all these certifications because in order for all of that to work, you actually need THX throughout the whole system from the speakers to the amplifiers to the processors, sometimes even the HDMI cables. THX has their own HDMI cables now. So, so there's a lot that goes into getting that set up. Um, so one thing you want to keep in mind there is, is there some sort of certification? Is there some sort of THX certification that lets you know the, the receiver is going to perform at a specific level? Now, the other thing you want to keep in mind is the calibration, right? So using an SPL meter is a great way to know how you want to listen, but a lot of these receivers have built-in calibrations. Now, you're gonna have, sometimes have to pay extra for these, and that's something you wanna keep in mind as you're shopping as well. So you might see something like, oh, where it has Dirac or Odyssey Pro. All of these are really great calibration tools, but a lot of times they're gonna cost sometimes as much as the receiver or even more just to get that working. Now, I'm a big fan of getting calibrated systems, so I think it's fully worth it. You know, you've got, you get the license once and you kind of are able to use it throughout the, the lifetime there. But for a lot of folks, you say, oh, my system's gonna get calibrated, but in fact, you might have to spend extra dollars to get that system, uh, the calibration system that is already built in, into the uh, into the receiver, get that license turned on. Okay, so what should you do before you're shopping for a receiver? I've laid out all the things that you need to look for, but really when you're shopping for a receiver or a processor and an amplifier, I'm gonna talk about that in a second, you wanna make sure that you list out kind of your dream setup. All the devices that you have, the requirements of that devices, whether you have a Blu-ray player, Apple TV, Nvidia Shield, whatever devices you're gonna to connect to it, Xbox, PlayStation, you wanna lay all those out and you wanna anticipate any future buying that you might do. So you might wanna say, okay, I only need four HDMI inputs right now, but down the line, I'm gonna add some equipment so I might as well get you know, one that has six or seven inputs in there. The other thing is, it's also from the channel perspective. When you're new to the home theater space, you always start off with a little bit of a smaller system. So you might start with a two channel system or three channels and a subwoofer and expand from there. But you wanna think about what your what your dream system's gonna look like and how many channels you're gonna need. If, if you would wanna have 5.1.2 or if you wanna go all the way up to you know 7.4.6, you wanna make sure you have a receiver that can handle the growth of your system as well. Now, as I mentioned before, you know, the receiver is an all-in-one system, the processing as well as the amplification. Now, here's my pitch. This is why I want everyone to go with separates. I know it's not the most convenient thing. I understand the appeal of having a receiver with an all-in-one system, but if you have separates, it's a much, much better value for your system for a lot of reasons. First, the processing is what changes the most inside of receivers. Amplifiers and amplification systems, that they can last for a very long time, right? I know folks who are using the same amplifier for the last 20, 30 years, and the only thing they do change out is their processor. And as they add more channels, they just add more amplifiers to it. So if you're an enthusiast and you're always looking for the latest, greatest text like I am, I'm always changing my processor about every four to five years. I think that's a really good metric to base off of the system. So I'm actually in the process right now of updating my whole system. I'm gonna be getting a new processor in here soon. I have a couple coming in for review, but luckily I don't have to change my amplifiers. I have a great piece of Hegel amplifier, a C55, and I have some Emotiva amplifiers that are working on my surround and Atmos speakers. So there's only one piece of equipment I have to buy. The other thing is it keeps the power the same throughout the system. And as I change the processor, I'll be able to tell if the processors is actually having an impact on my system, whether they're using better DACs, whether the calibration is better, more sophisticated. And that will allow me to know what receiver or processor to use. You'll see a lot of pre-outs on, on receivers, and this is also a really great thing. So you can use a pre out to add additional amplification and slowly build out your system that way. That's actually how I started. I had a receiver and slowly I bought amplifiers, started using the pre out, and then I got into a position where all I did was switch my receiver out for a processor. And now I'm gonna go to my 
next processor in the next you know six months or so i gotta do a little bit more research on what i want for my system here thanks for watching everyone and leave your comments and questions below for buying receivers if you have any additional questions if there's things you'd like me to go deeper in feel free to leave the comments below i hope this helps clear some things up as you guys are shopping for new receivers and i hope this makes it easier for you as you're looking at the specs and reading what's available out there if you have any specific questions on your setups or have any buying questions join us fridays at 1 30 p.m eastern time where i host a 30 minute live on youtube where i'll answer anyone's specific questions that they might have now, don't forget to hit like and subscribe for more news and reviews and deep dives on anything home theater and two channel audio. Catch you in the next one.